Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Lipson. I am uh, the secretary of the Scleral Lens Education Society, and uh, glad you're attending our Scleral Lens Education webinar. And uh, let's get started with this. Basically, uh, there is a question panel on your control panel there. And uh, you can ask questions on the screen, and I will get to see them, and we'll take them at uh, various times during the uh, webinar here. So please feel free to type in your questions, and I will be able to have a time to take them, and as well, we'll have some time at the end. But um, you can minimize the control panel, as it says on the uh, screen there, and uh, there is an emergency phone number if you need to get other information. Uh, first and foremost, I want to uh, thank our sponsors. We have uh, uh, our platinum sponsors of the Scleral Lens Education Society that help make all of this possible, AccuLens being one, Paragon Vision Science, Visionary Optics, Excel Contact Lenses, Blanchard Contact Lenses, and Alden Optical. These are our silver and bronze sponsors also, and uh, they are very important to all of us and uh, support all of our fitters as well. Uh, GP Specialists, National Keratoconus Foundation, uh, Advanced Vision Technology, Trueform, and Art Optical. So thank you to all for your generous support throughout the year. So basically, this is a scleral lens basics. Um, I'm a, an assistant professor at the University of Michigan. I do have a clinical appointment there, which means that I see patients just like all of you in practice. Uh, I do very little bit of teaching there, very little, but mostly it is uh, involved in seeing patients' specialty contact lens fits. So I hope to be able to answer your practical questions on this. As uh, usual, we have to make a disclosure slide. And relative to sclerals, I have no disclosures other than the, the secretary of the Scleral Lens Education Society. I also receive uh, uh, study sponsorship from Bosch and Lohman Paragon. So I hope all of you are fairly new to sclerals, interested in getting into it. And if you're just getting into it, this will be great for you tonight. Those of you who have fit some scleral lenses, hopefully we'll be able to give you some helpful hints that will help uh, pick up um, your fitting skills. First of all, if you've heard about sclerals and you're attending this, you probably know that sclerals have become a lot more popular. And there's a couple major reasons for that. First of all, they're very, very comfortable lenses. Uh, I would say it's equal or better than soft lenses. And uh, it's hard to imagine if you haven't really done this, that you see this large, rigid lens that it's going to be so comfortable. But really, there's no uh, interaction with the edge of the lens movement uh, like it is with a corneal lens. It tucks up under the lid. It rests only on the sclera. And it's really, really, really comfortable. Secondly, RGP optics provide great vision for our patients and uh, for a variety of different conditions. And as we'll talk about, there's a lot of options in terms of satisfying those vision correction needs. Uh, sclerals are also an improvement to patients' quality of life. And especially when we're talking about keratoconus patients, uh, keratoconus patients are highly dependent on their contact lenses and comfort and vision, and we can minimize their symptoms and keep their eyes healthy, and uh, they're just more confident going about their normal daily activities when they have a lens in that's so comfortable. And finally, we can provide these patients with excellent eye health using scleral lenses. Um, besides the fact that on normal corneas, um, the lenses are, are very healthy and they're made of materials that are very breathable, providing plenty of oxygen. For these patients who are dry eyes, it can actually make them more comfortable and healthier eyes because it allows, uh, say, epi defects to heal, ocular surface disease to be minimized. So it's, it's all good stuff for scleral lenses right now. Before we get going, I just wanted to define the terms that we use about scleral lenses. And this is 
something that's developed from our society actually is a definition of in scleral lenses a uh, definition of scleral lens is that it rests entirely on the sclera does not touch the cornea within that category there are two that we've decided to call mini sclerals and large sclerals uh, the mini scleral is a lens that is up to six millimeters larger than the patient's HVID and uh, that means if the patient has a uh, HVID of 13 millimeters which is a very large cornea and you have a 17 millimeter lens that's still considered a mini scleral for that patient whereas if the patient uh, had an 11 millimeter cornea and uh, you're using a lens that's a 17.2 it's more than six millimeters larger than the HVID that would be considered a large scleral and as we'll see in a minute diameter becomes a very crucial determination in fitting a scleral lens and again just as a review they are made with very high decay materials as listed here Boston XO, XO2, the Optimum Extra or Tyro 97, HDS um, 100 are all very good high decay materials for these scleral lenses. The picture that you see here is an 18-2 lens a lot of arrows and things it's very confusing but it just goes to show that essentially there's a lot of components to these lenses each of the manufacturers has different uh, proprietary curves that are put on the lens but you have a lot of control over what you can do with these lenses for your patients and of our patients who are you going to put these lenses? who's a good candidate for scleral lenses well this is basically not from uh, a textbook not from surveys this is from my own practice and essentially we're seeing that the majority are keratoconus patients and they're the ones that seem to appreciate uh, the benefits that scleral lenses offer the most but we do see uh, about 20 percent of them in corneal transplant patients a few ocular surface disease and and of course post refractive surgery patients um, I guess since this was the slide was even developed I think I've started fitting even a few more on very normal corneas and that's in the category of others down below but uh, again when you start to see keratoconus patient especially if they've worn other lenses in the past um, you should start thinking about sclerals right away and uh, when I go on vacation as a scleral fitter I don't just look at mountains I look at contour just like I think about cornea so if you have cornea that look like this on the profile are you thinking you're gonna be able to put a corneal lens on the top of that mountain or are you going to try to bridge over the whole thing and uh, fit it in a scleral lens and basically I've gotten to the point where I'm comfortable fitting these uh, scleral lenses very much as a first go-to lens other examples of uh, patients that you're going to be able to put scleral lenses on to benefit the patient these are the examples that we talked about where the upper left one over here I think you can see the arrow is a severe severe uh, exposure keratitis ocular surface disease patient as is the one in the upper right uh, down in the lower left is a chronic epi defect that won't heal and you put a scleral lens on you can leave it on most of the day some people will at first leave them on overnight on these patients for one or two nights but it is not done overnight on a regular basis and certainly the, the prototype example for this is this patient on the lower right which is a keratoconus patient who really um, has probably been through other lenses before uh, corneal lenses and a variety of other options that we have now that really not doing the job so now getting into this I think uh, most of you kind of know a little bit about sclerals but really what's the point of sclerals how do they work and the, the main thing is that the lens bears its weight on the sclera and it is fit based on the sagittal depth of the cornea and allowing the lens to be fit with a sagittal depth that exceeds that of the cornea so that it bears its weight on the sclera and there's no touch of the cornea total corneal clearance and that includes the limbus as well that we're not bearing on the limbus and 
you'll see that in a minute here, but in, in the diagram here, the, basically it shows a, a lens over a, um, an irregular shaped cornea, and this is just diagrammatic. It's obviously not that uh, dramatic on the real eye, but that there is a tear reservoir. That's the important thing to understand is that essentially you have a smooth layer of tears between the lens and the cornea, and the lens itself does not bear on the cornea whatsoever. In determining your final fit of the lens, um, again, it's going to depend on how elevated the cornea is, how much it's raised over the standard of the peripheral curve, and again, over the edge of the eye, the point of bearing. So, as you might be able to tell from this, the actual curvature of the cornea, or what we think of as K readings, is not as critical. So there are other things that are going to become more important, as we'll see in a moment here. Getting right to it here and getting into this, how are we going to fit a scleral lens? Well, there's different techniques that are used to determine how the lens fits and how to determine the lens that you're going to order that's going to be the most comfortable for that patient. Probably the mainstay of this is number one, a diagnostic evaluation of a fluorescein pattern with a known lens. In other words, your fitting set. These lenses are marked and created very accurately on computer-guided lathes and it is known exactly what the dimensions of that lens are. Number one, you know the sagittal depth of that lens should be given by the manufacturer and that's number one from my standpoint. I want to know what is the sagittal depth of the lens so that when you put it on there you can know uh, what kind of incremental changes you might need to make to make that fit ideal. And we'll get into this fitting specifics in a moment in terms of exactly what to look for. Another way to actually fit scleral lenses would be if you actually knew the scleral topography. Um, the only way to really do that at this point is with an OCT and sometimes that can be evaluated while the lens is on and you can do an OCT to see that you are clearing the cornea, clearing the limbus and, and the bearing and the edge profile. Uh, another new technique that is being uh, developed right now is techniques to use this new device called the eye surface profiler which will actually measure uh, scleral topography out to about 20 millimeters and it's totally different technology than uh, the placido disc based topography that we're now using and it uh, is being looked at in terms of a new way to do this and still not calibrated for fitting empirically. And the mainstay of corneal fitting has obviously been corneal topography. And again, as I said earlier, corneal topography actually becomes almost uh, irrelevant when we're doing this. I do still do it on every patient that I fit a scleral lens on to get an idea of what the corneal contours are in the elevations, uh, but not necessarily the curvature. And uh, when we, we do this, like I said, we are able to evaluate with fluorescein. And in the diagram on the lower right, you can see this is the edge of the lens here. So it's a very big lens, goes way, way beyond. This is a, be a large scleral lens, way beyond the limbus. Now, in putting a scleral lens on, there's a number of different parameters that could be varied to affect an ideal fit, make that patient very comfortable and long-term happy. So essentially, I put these in order of which one makes the biggest difference. In other words, if you were going to change the fit of that lens and try to determine, okay, what is going to make that lens ideal for the patient. The first thing that did, and the thing that makes the biggest change is the diameter of that lens. In general, I think we can do very, very well these days with these mini scleral lenses that are, you know, at least 
uh, less than six millimeters larger than the HVID. So if we have an average corneal diameter of 11.8, many of the lenses in the 15 to 17 range will do really, really well for these people. And again, the main thing is having enough of the landing zone so you can not have to come down really, really heavy on that landing zone. You have a larger area, a larger footprint to bear on and allowing you a large enough optical zone and uh, I guess vault centrally uh, to allow yourself to clear the limbus as well. So again, if we have this average 11.8 millimeter cornea. Normally I would start with a lens in the range of around a 16 millimeter lens. Next thing I look at is the actual sagittal depth of the lens that I'm going to choose. And uh, if you get a variety of different sets from different manufacturers, you'll find that there's a mid-range and that they may have a recommendation that they would say start with this if you have a, a normal elevation or an average elevation cornea. And uh, if you have one that's more advanced cone, you might start with the one that with a little more depth to try to clear that cornea. But again, that's something that comes with experience. Uh, again, the next thing would be the edge profile right at the landing area. How flat or how steep that is, there is a standard and you might say, okay, this is standard for this particular action. I want to make flatter for this patient. I want to make it steeper for the next one. The next thing that determines the parameters and the overall sagittal depth and fitting characteristics of the lens would be the peripheral curves. Um, how much it flattens or if there's reverse curves that were put on the lens to help bring that lens closer to the cornea. Um, the base curve is probably the one that changes things the least. Uh, again, you can have two lenses with identical base curves, different, different peripheral curves, and, and they would have totally different fitting characteristics. So, but these are the changes that you need to be able to understand to be able to change and affect the fit and change the overall sagittal depth of the lens. So again, as I said before, if you have a variety of different lenses, different manufacturers, there's a mid-range of that fitting set and that probably is a good way to start until you get a feel for what you're seeing and how much change you need to make for various characteristics that you'll see on patients. And with a little experience you will have a favorite starting lens for someone who say comes in with a very early cone versus a very severe cone. Um, and again, you probably are not going to be able to fit everybody with one particular brand of lens or one design. It will take a couple of them. And then again, some of them are more flexible than others in terms of varying all these things. But um, And again, when you look at the cornea before you've even put a lens on, looking at all your measurements that you've taken, uh, determining the elevation of the cornea, you may look and say, okay, this is a larger than normal cornea, so I'm going to need a larger lens. And uh, in general, uh, these patients who have highly irregular corneas, larger diameters are better to get over that. The smaller the lens, the harder it is to accomplish all of the things that you need to do to make that patient happy. Um, again, it takes a little bit of a learning curve. You're going to put a few lenses on different patients and you will learn with each particular lens, okay, this one needs a 200 micron difference for me to be able to see a difference or 200 micron or 300 micron difference to be able to say this is definitely clearing the cornea now. And there are lenses out there and different designs of scleral lenses. Some of them have fitting sets that are made up of you know, five to seven lenses, even 12 lenses, some of them to 34 lenses in that. But again, you have to get comfortable with that. Talk to the, uh, the people who manufacture these lenses about what their fitting philosophy and try to think about what makes sense to you. Now, this is probably one of the most important pictures of this whole presentation here. Again, what I said before, scleral lenses are fit based on the sagittal depth 
of the eye and not determined necessarily by K readings. And this is an example of a, a Scheinflug image of two patients with really totally different sagittal depth of their cornea. But if you took a central K reading on these patients, they would be identical. You know, this uh, approximately 44 K reading on this. And the main difference on these SEGs is, you know, you see it's a 1500 micron difference here. That's one and a half millimeter difference in sagittal depth based only on the fact that even with the same central curvature, it's a larger cornea, uh, larger HVID. And if you can burn that image into your head, this, this will start to make a lot more sense to you. And uh, again, it starts to make sense even if you think about soft lens fitting that some of the patients that you've had um, some difficulties with. But again, just take a look at that. And here is the sagittal depth measurement of this cornea here on the right, which is uh, about 4,000 microns here. And it's a larger horizontal visible iris diameter than the one on the left, which, like I said, a much smaller sagittal depth. So really important concept to grasp here. Again, when we're putting a lens on the eye, this is kind of an interesting thing. We may have seen this with other software programs, but this is the picture of what you would see in terms of the lens profile. When you put a lens on the eye, this is simulated where the bearing is taking place on this lens. Uh, ideally, we'd want to see the bearing 360 degrees all the way around here. And this is in the uh, horizontal meridian and this is a representation down below of the thickness of the tears beneath the lens and as you'll see during the uh, optical zone of about a 6.0 here uh, 12 millimeters actually it's 12 from here to here um, it averages uh, between 200 and 300 here and then comes down just beyond the limbus so that it bears its weight here that would be 7.2 or 14.4 millimeters in this 16 and a half millimeter lens. And this is kind of the anatomy of the lens where there's central clearance zone, a peripheral clearance zone, a limbal zone here, and a scleral landing zone. And basically, there's a little bit of an edge lift here right after it lands. So this is kind of the ideal of what we would look for. And this is kind of something to help put another way to image this for you. Another really, really important concept to understand in fitting scleral lenses is, is that we've been able to measure, you know, in the past, really good on the cornea, do topography out to about 10 or 11 millimeters and understand this, but once you get outside of the limbus, things change tremendously. And uh, I have to thank uh, my buddy Pat Caroline for this slide here, but this was uh, done with a number of normal patients, not um, diseased patients, but the number of patients were looked at to determine the average angle between 10 millimeter cord on the cornea to a 15 millimeter cord that's on the sclera. And they found that this was not necessarily a junction at the limbus, but more like an angle, and it's an average angle. And as you can see, nasally, temporally, pretty much the same. Superior, inferior, fairly close. So an angle, meaning uh, a steeper area. These, these numbers that are higher would be steeper, more curvature. Lower numbers would be flatter. So Basically, when we're dealing with lenses that are out to 15 millimeters, we can use these spherical landing zones really effectively here because it's going to be pretty equal bearing 360 degrees. Now, if what if we do this a little further out? We measure an angle from that 15 millimeter cord out to 20. Again, you can see superior inferior is a little bit different, but there's a very dramatic difference between nasal and temporal. 
this becomes really important if you're dealing with an 18 millimeter lens and you're landing it out at this point probably 17 18 millimeter cord it's going to hit on this nasal side faster it's going to hit earlier it's going to bear harder there and we know that basically just like with our corneal lenses lens it's a higher area flatter basically so what that means is it hits there and it pushes the lens temporally so lenses that are about 18 millimeters if you look at them quite a number of them will decenter slightly temporal and this is what becomes important in terms of uh, later on toric peripheral curves where we make a different curve uh, horizontally versus vertically and uh, here's a perfect example of that so again if we go back just for a second and look at this this was the 10 to 15 and here's the 15 to 20 that's represented by this red chord segment here that's the area that's being determined in the angle so again when you get further away from the limbus there's more asymmetry to the square that's the point to be made here so now you've pulled out a lens you're ready to put it on the patient what are you going to look for once that lens is on there well basically when you put that lens on to help your evaluation of this you're going to be doing this with uh, fluorescein you're going to put fluorescein in the bowl of the lens and you're going to use an optic section to evaluate the central clearance because you're going to be able to see that fluorescein Scene. You're going to be able to see fluorescein under the lens at the limbus. And then finally, you're going to be looking at the edge where you're looking for that gentle bearing where it doesn't bear down too hard or compress the vessels. You're not looking for, um, you don't want to avoid seeing impingement of the vessels or where, like I said, it compresses them. And we're going to show some pictures of that now. Now, if you've gotten into scleral lenses, this is something that you've probably already seen. But you're going to use your optic section with white light. This is with white light, not with a, your blue filter. And the picture on the left, when you use your optic section coming from the side, this first part here, that's the thickness of the lens. And you've already put the fluorescein in, and underneath the lens, you're going to see this layer of fluorescein or tears between the lens and the cornea. And this is the cornea the little back here. And we kind of look at what's on the left here. That's the thickness of the lens compared to the thickness of the tear layer. And we know what the thickness of the lens is. Each lens, like I said, some of them are in the range of about uh, 300 crowns. 0.3 millimeters. Some of them are made 0 0.35, 0 0.4. It just depends on the manufacturer. So you have to be able to look at that and be able to see. So here, basically, um, this is the, the black part here. This first part is the tears on top of the lens. But when you see black like that, just like it is over here, that's the thickness of the lens. This one happens to be a 0 0.30 millimeters or 300 microns and when you look at the tear layer thickness there it's at least twice the thickness of the lens it's about 600 microns and again if you look at the cornea and you say okay the average cornea is about 530 microns or 540 you know that, that makes sense with this doesn't it so that's a really really important thing to look at that's central clearance you're going to be able to evaluate this is another high magnification look at this and a little higher resolution too. Here's your tear layer on the front of the lens, the lens itself, which this one happens to be 0.35, and it's approximately the same thickness here of the tear layer. And here's your cornea. And again, if you can kind of gauge all these pretty well comparing them this is your built-in ruler it's the eye the tear layer and the lens and like I said if you actually did um, 
central corneal thickness readings, you could be even more accurate on this, but right now we know what the thickness of the lens is that you're putting on a patient. So if you guys have any questions right now, this might be a good place to uh, ask that now. And type it in if you like, that's please. And uh, if not, we'll keep on moving. I don't see any questions here. Um, so anyways, I guess we'll move on. Okay. Um, central clearance. Again, this is just a review of what we saw a minute ago where you're going to see, uh, again, a lens. This is a known lens that has a 4600 sagittal depth. Happens to be a 16 millimeter lens. And if we look at this, this lens is a 0.35 center thickness. It's about maybe a little bit smaller than that, but about 300 microns. And this is a lens that's put on the eye that's a 4900, 300 microns higher sagittal depth. And you can see the effect that it has on making a thicker tear film. It's maybe 550, 600 on that one. So again, you can be, it's not uh, crucial that you be precisely accurate on this, but you just got to know that you've got clearance. So this is a really good thing to, again, remember this look and play with it at your slit lamp. You'll be really good at it very, very quickly. This is a slide that we thank our friends at the Ferris State University. They did some very high resolution pictures to try to demonstrate the difference and try to grade this. And uh, again, here's our lens thickness of about 0.35. And the, the tear layer thickness there, really, really small. It's just barely clearing there, about 50 microns. Here's the lens thickness again. Here's the tear layer that may be about half of this. And we get that around 150. This one here, just about equal to the lens thickness here is the tear layer thickness. And again, the constant on this, this is all the same cornea here. And again, thicker tear film here and even thicker yet. So these were determined actually with uh, an OCT, so we know that they're accurate and high resolution. So central clearance, that's the number one thing we're looking for. We're going to move on in just a second here. If you do look at this with your blue light, this is kind of what you would see, and this is not a high resolution picture as you can see, but right now you're seeing that there's no clearance here. I mean, there is clearance, but there's no touching there, I'm sorry. Um, and that's what it looks like you know, with the optic section. This one here, you can start to see it's getting a little thinner right in that area, and that's what you're seeing here. It's not necessarily touching, but it's just less fluorescein visible there. And this is actual here where you see that there, you lose your, on the optic section, the tear layer altogether, and that's what it would correspond to, an area of bearing here. So, moving outward, like I said, I like to look at the central cornea first, uh, then move on to the limbus. And one of the first things you can look at, again, with the white light or with the uh, blue filter, is to look and see if you're getting the fluorescein bleeding out just beyond the limbus. And that's kind of the picture of what you'd see right over here. You're seeing some fluorescein here. It's getting thinner and thinner. And finally, not much at all but it's just bleeding out a little bit. And this is kind of what would be represented if you look at the OCT like this. The problem on the OCT is we don't know exactly where the limits is. It's kind of in this area here, and you can see this is the lens here, and it starts to bear right about here. And this is clearing the limbus, so that's one of the things that we're looking for. So, again, um, and the limbal clearance, you put your slit out there again, there's nothing there. It's touching. You see the lens, you see cornea, nothing in between. Here you're starting to see a little bit of tears uh, in the fluorescein pattern here. And here's a bigger one there where you see more thickness. Okay. 
basically, um, this is a good point to start. There's somebody asked a question here. How do you measure sagittal depth? Well, if you're, there's a sagittal depth of a lens, but there's a sagittal height of the cornea. And there's a sagittal height of your eye at the point of bearing. All of those things may be different. Um, essentially, what I'm looking for is um, elevation of the cornea. And it's probably really not measurable exactly, but like I said, it can be done with an OCT. It's not easy to do. They go out to about 15 millimeters, and you can actually get an overall sagittal height of that eye. And if you said, okay, I want to have 300 millimeter, 300 microns of clearance when I get done, you would take that measurement from the OCT and say you had a, a 4,000 uh, micron sagittal height and you said, I want 300, you maybe, well, I want a 40, 300 sagittal depth lens that's going to bear at 15 millimeters. Uh, so that's one way to do that. The other one is really just to do it by estimating with a known lens and how much clearance you have. Um, but again, before selecting your trial lens, you kind of get a, have to get a feel for it a little bit to uh, say, okay, this is a lens that has a very high sagittal depth, high, uh, I'm sorry, the cornea has a very high elevation or a very high um, <laughs> HVID. Okay, someone else, what is the thickness of that lens? Uh, the lens that you're seeing on the slide right now has a thickness that is not in the center, actually, it's by the limbus, and we can only estimate what that is based on the power of the lens and the optical zone. But this lens originally, you know, center thickness was about 0.35. So, okay. There's another question that came up. Is it, it says the um, center thickness of the diagnostic lens alters. You know, when you try a lens on patients um, post-LASIK, it, it would be not very helpful in comparing the tear layer with the cornea. Um, again, in most of the sets of lenses that you get, the center thickness is standard, and they will write it on there. And if they don't have it, you can specify it from each manufacturer. They will do that. And uh, you can ask them to actually send you lenses all with standard center thicknesses on that. Um, and again, when you get your lenses made for the patient, you can specify that you can ask them to tell you exactly what the center thickness is. Um, okay, next question on here was in the previous slide, the limbal clearance photo, where can you appreciate the fluorescein bleeding out. Um, was that edge lift as well? well? Let's go back to here for a second here. Again, bleeding out means you can see some um, fluorescein at this point. It's obvious, but it gets thinner and thinner. So that's the point that I was trying to make there. Anyways, we're going to move on a little bit right now. and. After we reach the limbus here and evaluated that we're getting clearance there, the last thing to look at would be the edge. Now, the picture on the left is what would be called impingement. And you might see that even very soon after you put the lens in, but more likely you would start to see that on a more uh, pronounced basis after the lens has been in for about 20 to 30 minutes. That it would start choking off the um, the conjunctival vessels there, and you'd know that's bearing a little too heavy at that point. Whereas here you see that's really, really smooth, very clear. And this is the same eye with just a higher edge lift. And that's what you would do when you see a lens like this. You say, well, that particular edge is too heavy. We need to actually elevate 
increase the edge lift or make it flatter. That's another way to put it. And this is another way to evaluate the edge. Uh, this is kind of a, a, a gross example of this. It's, it's rare that you would see this. This is like what you see fluting of a soft lens where it's actually lifting away. And you, you know, usually when you put a lens on that's that loose, the patient's going to tell you right away this is not comfortable. A normal lens uh, feeling and reaction would be, it's a very, very comfortable lens. But this one here is a little too loose. This one gets the next step tighter and, or less elevation at the edge or a lower edge lift. There's different ways to describe that. And then here we start going even lower and just, just a hair beginning, you're starting to see a little more redness here. And then this is where you start seeing it bite in a little bit. So this one in the upper left is too flat. This one is too steep or you know too much bearing at the edge. And this is probably the ideal one here in the upper right. And again, um, this particular slide shows both of the examples of what I was talking about before is number one, it shows you have fluorescein showing up beyond the limbus out here. And always, it's really a good idea where you do in all four quadrants to get a look at this blood vessel here. You can follow this blood vessel straight through. It's not being deflected. Uh, you see the same thing here. You can follow a blood vessel here from the edge out all the way over here out. So again, there's no compression, no redness. The vessels are unimpeded. You can see blood flow there. So smooth blood flow all the way through there. So the next thing we're going to show, I guess we'll move on. After we've evaluated the initial fitting, I think it's a good idea probably take one question here that, you know, how long do you wait to evaluate the fitting of this? Is basically when I do this first, I'll put the lens on the patient with the fluorescein. I'll immediately look at the lens and sometimes with a handheld a flashlight or blue light just to make sure there's no bubbles that occurred during the application process. Once that is on and done, I may leave the room, see another patient and come back in about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, you may have heard that lenses will sink in or settle. On the app. The, most of the studies show that there's between 80 and 130 microns of settling during an eight-hour period. Most of that takes place during the first hour of wear. So I guess I have done a routine where I will try to evaluate that lens 20 to 30 minutes later and still have uh, enough clearance to allow for even a little more settling later on. Now, after your initial fit, you might see some complications with these lenses. Things that can happen are buildup of debris under the lens, you know, what we call suction or conjunctival prolapse where it's actually sucked up, the, the conj is sucked up under the lens and it actually overlaps onto the cornea. And uh, the example here is just uh, on the lower right is another example of impingement that happens just later after lenses have been on for a while. Um, one other thing I'd like to make sure you understand on these lenses and scleral lenses, they take different techniques for applying and removing lenses. Um, when you're going to put them on patients, um, just like when the patients are applying them themselves, uh, you have to bring the lens up to the eye with the bowl of the lens full of solution. And we tend to uh, use these little devices to help hold the lenses. And uh, when you're putting it on after you get the lens full of non-preserved saline and you think it's full, put three more drops in and just fill it up so it's overloaded. Uh, put your fluorescein in there. doesn't have to be a ton of fluorescein, but get it in there so it looks like you've, you can see the fluorescein in there and then apply the lens. Um, and this is uh, an example, like I said, that happens Occasionally you get a bubble in there. You don't want to see that bubble in there when you're putting the lens on. Um, I like Unisol or the sodium chloride inhalation solution ampules. 
to use because these come in these little three millimeter ampules. You can have them use them. The advantage of these is that they don't have any buffering agent in it either, as the Unisol does, which some people have responded to. So, in removing the lens, use the small uh, suction device DMV remover, but don't try to pull it out from the center straight outwards. Have the patients grab the lower part and kind of pull it away from the eye in that angle, up, not straight out, kind of on a pulling. Try to break the suction near the edge because there is a natural suction to that. But again, when you're in the fin, the evaluation of this, make sure you use the preservative-free saline. Uh, add the uh, fluorescein with the, the strip and uh, patients are in this face down position. And uh, if I'm putting on the patient, I often enlist their help to actually hold the lower lid because they can kind of get in there a little better sometimes than with our fingers in there, but pull that lid way down. Um, in evaluating uh, kind of a summary of what we just talked about, the, just the real basics of the first fit, you got to be able to see a few of these and uh, it really helps to see them once you've seen them. It's a pretty quick learning curve, I think. Um, first thing you do is with white light, evaluate the central clearance as it is on the left picture down here. And you've got some clearance there, record how much of it it is. You might want to do it initially and then later on and just get a feel for this settling effect. If you want an overview of it, you can put your blue light on and look around and just see if you see any areas of thinning or bearing. And um, next thing, move out a little further. You look at the limbus. You can do this with the optic section. Look at it with straight on view and you're looking for a little of this. It's not always this pronounced, but this is a, a really good example to show that. Uh, again, after your central clearance is good, your limbal clearance is good, evaluate where it's bearing. You see out here is nice. Everything on this picture looks great. So look for basically um, no vessel deflection. You're looking for any signs of impingement at all, but really try to make sure that it just looks smooth. It's a white, clear eye. An important thing to realize is that Again, many patients that you put these scleral lenses on, you know, the just like rigid optics of any corneal lens, the optics will be taken care of. You'll be using a spherical design lens and providing the patient with great vision. Occasionally, uh, you may need to do some special things in terms of aspheric designs for some of these highly um, eccentric corneas with the high keratoconus to help bring it down. Aspherics sometimes help on the back. Uh, optically, with some of the post-graft or post-refractive surgery patients, sometimes you have some residual cylinder that needs to be taken up with a toric. And these lenses stabilize really, really well with um, front toric designs and posterior toric peripheral curves keep that lens very, very stable, rotationally stable. Um, some of them require reverse geometry because the elevation of the cornea change so rapidly. You have an area that's almost touching and then an area next to that where there's too much clearance. So some of these reverse curves help bring the lens closer in those areas. Um, we also have really nice advantage of having multifocal optics available in scleral designs. Obviously, they're not translating type bifocals. They can be made center near mostly or it can be done with the center distance, but uh, you can provide distance and near with this. And uh, there are now a new lens that came out with a sports tinted type scleral design for <laughs> extra help here. Um, there are resources to help you learn, get started in this. Besides what we're doing today, this is a, a little plug for the Scleral Lens Society. Uh, you can look, there are case reports online at this uh, website. There are resources in terms of videos for application and removal for you and for your patients to view. Uh, just like this, we provide courses, webinars, there are workshops that are done throughout the country and at various meetings throughout the year. And if you really get into this and want to prove 
uh, your competency on this, you can apply for fellowship by just presenting cases. Uh, the GPLI also has uh, resources of pictures, uh, webinars, things like that. And I guess the last plug I would give is for the manufacturers. They have very good consulting departments. Please use them uh, because they're very experienced with this and they can help you get started. They can be your uh, your legs to really get you started with this and get you confident. Uh, I think it also helps to have a mentor. Um, there are people who uh, are in your area who fit the lenses or friends of yours in other parts of the country that you can communicate through email or with phone calls to say, hey, how do you handle this situation? How, how does this come up for you? It really works well. And uh, I've, I've really enjoyed uh, talking to people about this and once you get started I mean it's a fairly fast learning curve you're gonna fit the first two or three lenses and lens patients it's gonna take you a little longer but after about that fourth or fifth patient uh, you're gonna feel very very confident and the patients are gonna give you some great great feedback on this okay um, okay here's a couple questions here that I'm going to take. Um, if there's good clearance but vessel blanching, what change would you make to the lens parameters? That's a great question. Actually, if you've got good central clearance and you've got some blanching where you're seeing it's compressed too much, first thing you would change talking about with your lab about how to make the edge lift higher. Higher edge lift flatter peripheral curve, whatever they decide to say. There's different terminology that's used on that. But that's the first thing to change. It will lower the central clearance slightly when you do that, but again, you might have to make other compensations if, you, if it's too much, but usually you might need to only change it 30 to 50 microns of the edge clearance and it may not change the central part that much. Another question uh, was about does insurance cover the sodium chloride uh, inhalation vials? Um, I'm not really versed in that. I don't know for sure, but I have seen this um, <laughs> require a prescription to get this, even though it's only saline. At the same time, it's available on Amazon for relatively inexpensive, maybe uh, $20 for a hundred of these things. So again, I would say it might vary in your experience in terms of the insurance coverage for this. Care solutions. Great question. What do we recommend for this? For scleral lenses, uh, you have a lot of options. Some people will like to use standard RGP solutions like Boston or Unique pH or Optimum solutions to store the lenses in, but I would definitely say gas permeable solutions are not good for application of the lens. You definitely want to use the saline. Other disinfection options are also soft lens solutions, BioTrue, OptiFree, and probably my preferred way is clear care because it not only provides the disinfection but also the cleansing action. The biggest problem with the clear care is the baskets and if you get a lens that has anything more than 16 millimeters or extremely high vaulting or sagittal uh, depth of the lens it may not fit in that basket without being compressed. Um, my technician came up with a great option for this which basically involves taking the little covers of the baskets off and using two separate clear care cases, one for the right eye and one for the left. It just lays on that thing and it won't fall off of there, but just you have to make sure you know which one's the right and left on there. But uh, good question. Again, we can go into a lot more detail on that. Um, what's my experience in fitting ptosis patients? Does it help uh, in enhancing the vision? Um, I would say it help a little bit. Sometimes the thickness of the lens will actually help keep the lid up. Uh, but that would be on a pretty much a custom basis. I'd like to move on to a, another question on this, which uh, says, changes to the limbal zone, will it affect the sagittal depth of the lens? Most definitely, yes. Um, 
there are a couple different designs of lenses now that are really, really innovative and allow you to change one zone without changing anything else to the other ones. And uh, if you want to write to me um, specifically about uh, these, I can give you those names. I don't want to support them right now in this uh, and talk about their names, but I'm going to go through that. Um, anyways, uh, how about the tear clearance pressure and the effect over the corneal surface? Well, I think that's a very, very good question there. Um, I think that the um, the clearance pressure, like I said, if you have too much pressure outward and it's pulling in, that will create some conjunctival prolapse. And usually that happens from over vaulting. It's too much vault in center and you have to put too much pressure outside, you want to try to make it as even as possible. Um, but, okay, thank you. I'm glad we have people in attendance here from Mexico. That's great. Um, is there an optimal central clearance? Great question. <laughs> That's a long answer though. Um, I would say depending on the type of patient there may be, and the type of lens, it can vary. Meaning on a keratoconus patient, you might only need the, to clear the steepest and highest elevation of that cornea only by between 50 and 100 microns. Uh, as opposed to somebody who is an ocular surface disease patient where you may want 300 or more clearance. If you're fitting scleral lenses on normal eyes, I would say an average clearance that you're looking for initially on putting the lens on is about 250, and then it would probably be somewhere between 100 and 150 after they've had it on for a little while. But that's a big, big debate right now in terms of do we want to have a lot of clearance? Do we want to have... Um, a lot of tears under there, do we want to try to minimize the tear thickness for our oxen transmissibility issues? Um, okay. Uh, I think I picked up a few of the questions here, maybe not all of them. We're coming to the end of the time here. Like I said, going back to the slides here, I wanted to say for sure, um, get back to the resources here. If I can do that real quick here, I guess not. <laughs> um, like I said, I wanted to be able to have you contact the Scleral Lens Society or the RGP for all those resources. Go to seminars, uh, here it is, go to uh, wet labs, basically get familiar with this, get comfortable with it. It's really, really good. Um, I think once you get a little bit of a feel for this, it's not a hard thing. Most of us from optometry school have all the skills that you need right now to be able to do this. You just need to learn a little trick on what to look for. Um, so I think we're just about at the end of the time. Uh, I appreciate you attending, your attention. You guys have been great. Um, and uh, like I said, I hope that you guys get into this enough that you all become fellows of the Scleral Lens Education Society. So again, uh, thank you for attending. The next um, seminar for this will be in the fall. I think in September they're doing one. So uh, the topic is uh, still to be determined, but look for the Scleral Lens Society um, thing in the fall. So you'll be getting emails on that. Again, thank you for attending. Have a good evening.